All right, so we are in the final class tonight, and what we've been doing is unpacking the idea that in 2 Corinthians 5.17, right, Paul says that if any person is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. And so the final thing we're going to cover tonight, sort of this is the final portion of the quad of walking with God, the quad of walking with God, the first part being your relationship to God as a father, as your heavenly father, and what all that means. The second part of the quad being how you relate to yourself, because you relate to yourself in a new way with your spirit no longer in control. Uh, I mean, with your soul no longer in control. And then last week, we covered the idea of how we interact with other people. And we interact with them in the atmosphere of love, the love that God bestows on us, the forgiveness that God bestowed on us. And so all of our interaction with every other person needs to be saturated in the realm of love and forgiveness. And so we looked at that from a couple of different angles. And so what I want to do tonight is I want to begin with a, uh, well, let me, let me start by saying this. When you were born again, when you accepted uh, becoming a part of God's family and he became your father, um, you moved from darkness into light. And I'm going to explain what that means in a few minutes. All right. But there was a transition from darkness into light when you stepped into this meaningful, real relationship with the Lord. What I'm going to share with you tonight is sort of coming from, again, a lot of what how I understand walking with the Lord these days comes again from that experience in my life that I was referring to earlier, where I was diagnosed with a terminal disease, told that I was had probably less than five years to live, and there was absolutely no hope. It was a terminal disease called ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. Two and a half years later, it was discovered they had misdiagnosed me. I have a different neuromuscular disease. But that chain of events that started with that diagnosis provoked a lot of things. And so one of the things that provoked, when you're diagnosed with that terminal disease, the neurologists tell you you need to think about what's called an advanced directive. And an advanced directive is basically what you want them to do with you when you reach a certain point in the progress of the disease. So ALS takes away your, it, it, it shuts down your voluntary muscle system. And what that means is you eventually lose the ability to swallow and then you lose the ability to breathe. And that's what usually takes your life. So they tell you very frankly, that you need to think about when you can no longer swallow, do you want to go on a feeding tube? That's the only way you'll stay alive is if we set up a feeding tube and give you nutrition directly into the stomach. At a future point in time, sometimes they're not in this order, most times they are in the order of swallowing first and then breathing, this is the big one, when you reach the point where you can no longer breathe on your own because your diaphragm, which is a muscle, it's weakened to the point you can't inhale and exhale. When you come to that point, do you want to go on a ventilator? And then if you choose to go, if you don't choose to go on a ventilator, you will die within minutes of your last ability to breathe. If you choose to go on a ventilator, then your next decision is how long you want to stay on the ventilator. Because you can live a long time on a ventilator breathing for you, but you need to think ahead of time, how long do you want to be on that when you can't move any other thing in your body except your eyes? You can't move your head, you can't move any muscle, you're completely trapped in a body, usually not in pain, and all you can move is your eyes and blink. And there are computer programs now where you can communicate with just only that capacity. But you need to decide, how do you... How long do you want to be on a ventilator and have that agreed upon so that when it's time, when you've decided, you've already thought about it, when should they pull the plug on the ventilator? And so this, we were forced into this. This forced my wife and I to plunge into what does God's word say about life? What is life? And as we started studying life, which... Uh, was an interesting study, both from a physiological angle and uh, from a 
spiritual, non-material angle, uh, we plunged into the word, I plunged into the word in particular, and I did a lot of study on physical life. And then what does the scripture say about life? And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just stitch together for you real quickly two concepts that it's important to understand that relate to how do we relate to stuff and things. Number one, if you're thinking about it, and we don't give it much thought, life scripturally and physiologically is the capacity, the ability to interact and exchange with that which is external to you. God has designed us. We are not self-contained beings. For us to exist, we must have an interaction and exchange with that which is external to us. We must breathe, take in oxygen and nitrogen. We must exhale. We must have an exchange with that which is external to us. That is life. The other thing we need to exchange with is food and water. We must take that which is external to us, take it inside of us, and exchange happens in our body, and then we let it free. And that is what life is, the capacity to interact and exchange with that which is external to you. When you can no longer drink, if you stop drinking, or well, let's put it this way, you stop eating, you can make it roughly, most people, 60 to 70 days, and then you will die if you stop eating right now. If you stop drinking, you'll make it, if you're really in good shape and some other factors involved, you'll make it four days with no intake of liquids. And I don't need to tell you about breathing. Hold your breath. You won't make it more. Most of us are going to be gone in three to four minutes. You stop interacting and exchanging with that which is external to you. That's what we call death. And that's how you know when something is dead, when your dog is dead, your cat is dead, when a plant is dead. It's no longer interfacing with that which is external to it. So that's what life is. All right. Now, in John, when I study this, you cannot go very far studying the concept of life in the scripture. God created us in his image and likeness. He could have created us automatons where we don't need anything external to us, but we're created dependent on that which is external to us. Breathing, water, food, and of course, for our non-material part, interaction with God and other people. We are designed to be interdependent. We are designed for intermutuality. So death is not the cessation of existence, right? Death is detachment from that which is external to you, and without that, you have what we know as death. But when you study it in the Word, you'll always see, not always, most of the time, you'll see life tied in with light. Life and light go together. John 1, verse 4, in him, talking about Jesus, was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So life and light go together a lot in the scripture. You can't separate them. And you'll see why that's significant here in a minute. Um, Basically, life, again, understanding that it's interaction and exchange, what is eternal life? We don't have life spiritually prior to being born again. When we are adopted into God's family, when we accept that adoption... We come alive. We're a new creation in Christ. Now we have life because we're interacting and exchanging with our creator the way he designed us to. We were not previous. And so life, that concept is important. In 2 Timothy 1.10, and and it's interesting because Paul makes a distinguish, he distinguishes between um, life And immortality, meaning living a long time. We tend to think eternal life is unending, that the primary point of eternal life is it's life that never ends. It's not, scripturally. Okay? Listen to Paul says in 2 Timothy 1.10, he says, but God's grace has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light. Jesus brought life 
and immortality. So he distinguishes between immortality, not dying, and life. He doesn't weave them together. Jesus made it as clear as possible in John 17. He says, and this is, as he's talking to the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane, hours before he's going to be beaten and crucified. This is eternal life in John 17, 3. This, what, is, what is eternal life according to Jesus? That they may know you. That's it. What is eternal life? Having a personal, interactive relationship with God through Jesus. It's not living a long time. Jesus did not say this is eternal life, life that never ends. No, this is eternal life that they may know. And the Greek word means personal experiential interaction with something. Right? My dad was an auto mechanic. I grew up knowing about cars, but I'm all thumbs. So I had mental knowledge of a car and how it works, but I could not work on it. My dad knew cars. He had personal, experiential, interactive experience with a car and what makes it work and how to fix it and so on and so forth. There's a big difference between knowing how an engine works and actually fixing one, right? So eternal life, according to Jesus, is an interactive, personal relationship with the Father. And by the way, it doesn't end. The point is not a never-ending life. According to Jesus, eternal life is personal interactive relationship with your creator through his son. Okay, so that's life. Let me get to light real quick, and and I'll make the bridge here in a second on, on, on how this relates to how do we interact with stuff. Okay, so light. Now, you're all familiar with the concept of light. You know, I'm not a physicist, but I've, I've read a few things about light. And we used to, in the past, think light was primarily com- uh, made up of waves. Uh, now, uh, we know that light, light is composed of waves, but it's also composed of, come on, you physicists in the room, help me. Is it particles? What is it? Yes, yes, you smart guys in the room know that, okay? So it's very complex. But the simplest way, when we say the word light, what we're talking about is that which illuminates, that which reveals, that which makes known. One way to define light is the lack of darkness. One way to define darkness is the lack of light. But the primary way most of us understand light is its capacity to reveal and make known. But I submit to you that's not its ultimate purpose. Okay? It does that. But we have to take Jesus, who is the light of the world, and I'll make that clear in a minute. We have to use him as the example because he is, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Here's the key concept to understand about light. It doesn't just illuminate But because it illuminates, it makes proper interaction possible. Right? Because we can see, we can interface with what's in front of us the right way. So, if we had a power outage right now, and the earth started rocking, and we said, get out of here you would stumble over one another. You trip over the chairs. You remove the light. You can't interact and interface with that which is there without the light. The light makes possible proper interaction. That's the main thing to think and remember about light. Light makes proper interaction possible. Okay? So... What happens then is when Jesus steps into his creation, he's preceded by it. I'm going to to flesh this out for you here now. When Jesus is ready to begin his ministry, when the creator steps into his creation, when the word became flesh and dwelt among us, when the light stepped into the darkness as he's beginning his ministry, John the Baptist... (coughs) 
preached. And in, in, it's, it's recorded in Luke chapter 3, verses 9 to 14. You can write this down and look it up later. But what I want you to see is that John the Baptist is preaching the gospel. He's saying, confess and repent because the kingdom is here. The king of kings is here. And so his audience, as he says, as part of his preaching, hey, the time has come. Even now, the axe is ready to hit the root of the trees, right? The creator is stepping into his creation. The one who called Israel is coming to Israel. Part of what he's going to be is an axe. He's going to, he's going to lay the axe head on those who should have been representing him. There's going to be a separation that's going to take place because he's come. And as he's, as he's preaching, uh, he says, every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him. So I want you to listen to what the crowds asked. They've heard the message that the ax is here <laughs> and he's here and he's going to whack some of us. You guys need to repent and confess your sin and be baptized to demonstrate publicly your confession. When they heard that, listen to what they said. The crowds asked, what do we do? How do we demonstrate that we're confessing our sin and repenting of it? What should we do? And he says, well, whoever has two coats, share with him who has none. You truly repentant? You view your stuff differently. You got two jackets? You find somebody that doesn't have any and you give them one of your jackets. That's living in the light. That's interacting with stuff properly. That's evidence of repentance. It changes the view that you have of what you have control over, what you possess. And then the tax collectors in the crowd said to him, teacher, what shall we do? You guys all know what tax collectors were in those days, a Jewish, particularly Jewish tax collectors. He said, collect no more than you're authorized. Change your behavior. Your evidence of repentance is, instead of using your position and power and authority of the government to collect taxes and a little bit from me, stop it. Turn away from that. Don't take any more than the government has given you authority to take. Right? That's the evidence, the fruit, that you're serious about turning to God. That your change of mind about your relationship with God changes the way you live your life and it changes the way you view your stuff. And then soldiers said, verse 14, and we, what do we do? Now keep in mind, these were, apparently there were Roman soldiers in the mix of the crowd of people that went out to hear John and be baptized. And so everybody's thinking, if we're confessing and we're repenting, where, what is the evidence that God's looking for? And the point is, the evidence is you start to view what you have authority and power over in a new way. And so what shall we do? Well, don't extort money from anyone by threats or false accusations. And listen, be content with your wages. Now, having lived in the Philippines, done a lot of ministry in a lot of other countries, one of the things we have to understand as Americans, the San Diego PD, when I used to work with them years ago, had a special officer called the Asian Relations Officer. Because in those days, there were a lot of refugees that had come from Vietnam and Cambodia and other countries. In those countries, you see a cop, you go the other direction. You have no feeling of comfort when you see a cop. You see somebody with power and authority that's going to abuse their power and authority over you and take advantage of you. So the police departments had to have special guys to go in these communities and say, our cops don't accept bribes. They're not to be feared. The last person in Cebu, if you have a crime, the last person you call is a cop. Because they're going to use the situation for their own gain. And that's how it is throughout most of the world. That, again, is a window into the bubble that we live in here in America. The fact that we get up every day and expect the government to be honest. 
to take care of us? That we have a say in who governs us? That institutions are to be trusted? Like, there's only a few people on this planet that wake up with that every day. Most of the West world gets up and knows their government's not there to do anything for them except take advantage of them. But that's how it was at the time of Jesus. That's how it has been throughout history. So don't extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusations. And now we'll get to this in a minute. Be content with your wages. And the military guys that were in my church in Cebu Philippine military guys and guys I knew in the Thai military when I did ministry in Thailand and other places, their wages are very low. And so they rationalize extorting money from people because their wages are so low. And Jesus, and that's how it was in these days, but Jesus, John, I mean, is saying, be content with your wages. So there was an understanding At the time John preached that to surrender to God, to confess and repent, provokes a change in the way you interact with what you have control over. Your stuff. Okay? Jesus then starts his ministry, and he begins with the Sermon on the Mount. And in the Sermon on the Mount, which is covering all the facets, the Sermon on the Mount covers everything I've covered in the last four weeks, but better. (laughs) He covers it better. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, you guys are familiar with this. First, he says, you're the salt of the earth, right? But if salt loses its saltiness, it's, it's useless. So why does he say you, his people, are the salt of the earth? Because salt in those days and throughout the world, is not primarily a flavoring additive. Salt is life. The main purpose of salt is it stops decay. It stops putrefaction. It impedes corruption. That's the purpose of salt. You take something which is unique, you shove it into something that is already, that by its own makeup is decaying and is prone to putrefaction. You put salt in it, The salt is totally opposite, but when you put it in it, the salt stops the progress of decay and corruption and putrefaction. So when I first went to the province in the Philippines where there's no electricity and I saw them catch fish and they would gut the fish and split them open and there was no refrigeration. They would take piles of salt and rub it into their fish and they would lay them out on the street, let them be baked by the sun And that fish was good to eat for four or five days. Not a refrigeration at all. Salt impedes. That's why Jesus said you are the salt of the earth. Because this world is dark. It's in decay. It's natural inclination. It's corruption, as Phil is pointing out on Sunday mornings. It's not going to change. It's a train waiting for a wreck. But in the midst of this, God's people, we are the salt And one of our purposes is we hinder the decay. We slow down the putrefaction. But Jesus said it's only if you are salt that's lost its flavor, it's useless. If your capacity to stop decay and corruption is gone, you're useless. When the church gets to the point where it doesn't stand in opposition, not with words, but in the way we live our lives, stopping the decay of where cultures naturally go, we being a subculture within the larger culture where the same things are not happening in us that are happening out there, we're being salt. But he then also says, verse 14, you're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. You don't take a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, it gives light to all who are in the house. Now listen to what he says. Let your light so shine before men that they will see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You are the light of the world. The world is in decay. It's corrupt. It's putrefying. You are the salt and you are the light. You bring illumination. You make visible what was invisible. Previous, 
but you don't just make it visible. You are interacting with stuff, people, God, yourself, this class, right? All four components. You are intera interacting with God the way God designed you to because you're a new creation in Christ. So when he says, let your light so shine before men, we are here to illuminate what's actually taking place by the way we live, by the way we interact with God, and ourselves, and other people, but also by the way we interact with stuff. And when he says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your what? Your good works. That's not... The good work of you don't drink anymore. You don't look at porn anymore. That's not the good work of, you know, you're a nicer person. You don't cuss anymore. That's not what that word means. That, that concept is literally what? Good works. Deeds. Good deeds for the benefit of other people. So you, as the light of the world, you now see what you have control over, what you possess where well, you have the authority to determine how it's used, you use it in a way that blesses other people. You do good works. And when you do those good works, you're relating to your stuff the way God designed you to. It blesses other people and it reflects his glory. And so... He says, and this is a radical statement for Jesus to make, that the unbelievers will bring glory to your Father in heaven by observing you do good works. When you stop using your stuff for your own purposes and your own ends, and you use it to bless them, they're going to pay attention to that. Why would you do that? Why are you taking what you earned, what you worked for, and using it? To bless me. And then they will go, what kind of God do these people serve? What kind of God do they serve where their view of stuff is so radically different than what I and everybody else in my culture has been taught about stuff? Right? So are you tracking with me? Yes. This is like, then, then he goes on in that sermon. In chapter 6, verse 19, and we'll unpack this a little bit more. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Right? In other words, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, because on earth, moth and rust destroy. If your treasure is basically that which is of your highest, ver you know, that thing which you value the most, what you treasure is what you've intellectually placed value on. Treasure is primarily started in the mind. It's using the mind to make a, 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 a conclusion, assign value to something else. And Jesus says, do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth. If you're living as if this earth is all there is, and you're building treasures for here, here, you've got to pay attention to who's getting at your treasure. Moth and rust can destroy your treasure. Where is your treasure located? No, thieves can break in and steal. So if your treasure is wrapped up here on things of the earth, you're going to spend a lot of your time trying to preserve it, knowing there's things that are trying to take it away. But if... Your treasure is in heaven. Lay up for yourselves what? It's, it's good to lay up treasures. God's not saying treasures are bad. It's where do you lay up your treasures? We're all treasure hunters and treasure seekers. We're designed to seek treasure. But the treasure that we were designed to seek is our God who created us. And his glory. And we, because of sin, have switched the label. And we've made stuff and accumulating here things our highest priority. And so Jesus makes it clear. Lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven 
where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. For, and I, I don't have time to unpack this. This is a whole separate message. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's a deep saying right there. I mean, that's like, you can ponder that for weeks. I've been pondering it for years. Because we operate with what? Where your heart is, that's where your treasure is. No, Jesus teaches where your treasure is. What you've intellectually decided is meaningful, worthless, I mean, has worth, value. Where it's at, where your mind settles on it, your heart's going to follow. Your heart is not going to lead. Your heart, by God's design, is going to follow. And if what you've settled on is important, your heart's going to eventually follow what your mind has decided is important. And so God's paying attention to what we do after we come to know him. He's paying attention to how we interact with stuff. He's paying attention to it. And and that's why it was clear what John the Baptist said. That's why it's clear in the life and ministry of Jesus. And and when I, one of the things I do when I train churches on sending missionaries and caring for missionaries, I use the book of Philippians as a four, four foundational model for sending and caring for missionaries. And one of the points that Paul makes with the church at Philippi, who he started with Silas, you can read about it in Acts 16, right? And we talked about Acts 16 last week because that's where Paul took the beating he didn't have to take. He accepted beating and imprisonment that he didn't have to take because it turned the tables of power with the magistrates. You remember that? Okay. In chapter four, he's talking, he's in prison as he writes, and he says, you guys have blessed me time and time again. You've been participants in what I'm doing in, in sharing the gospel and planting churches and preaching the gospel. And, and he says, you, you've sent money more than once. And then he makes this point, not that I seek the gift. I'm not saying this because I want you to send more money. It's not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. So Paul is saying God is paying attention to the way you use your money to further his global purposes. Paul is saying when you send money, your money... Two missionaries, God's keeping score. That's putting your treasure in heaven. And he goes, I want your account with God to be full. Because God's keeping score on how you use everything that he's given you control of. And that everything that he's given you control of is not just your money, but your talent, your personality, your life experience. You are stewards of everything that God has stocked you with, your life inventory. And we were designed by God to be good stewards, to manage that which is not ours, but has been given to us. And how do we manage it? We manage it to bring him glory and for the good of other people. Okay? There's a classic song. Some of you are old enough probably to remember it. That's all the lumber. Anybody remember that? You can Google it, uh, YouTube it. Eli is the singer. And the song basically goes, it's about Peter, I mean about a guy dying, and he's meeting Peter at the pearly gates. And Peter's like, oh, we're so glad. I mean, the angel's like, oh, we're so glad that you're here. No, Peter meets him at the gate, walks him down the street. Hey, we're glad you're here. And the guy's like, oh, Jesus said he's going before me and he's preparing a mansion for me. I can't wait. And as they're walking down the street, it's like a 4,000 square foot house. And then they keep walking. It's a 3,000 square foot house and smaller and smaller. And they get to the end of the street and it's like an eight by 10 shack. And Peter goes, well, here you go. He's like, wait a minute. I thought Jesus said he was going ahead of me to build me a mansion. What is that? And the refrain of the song is, that's all the lumber, that's all the lumber, that's all the lumber you sent. You can look it up. Eli. Like, what's the point? God's keeping score. How much are you sending ahead? 
right? And so the crescendo moment of Jesus being light and, 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 and demonstrating what light actually is and how it works is in John 8. Now, all of you are familiar with the I am's of Jesus. There are seven of them. We're covering them. And actually, I'm going to cover this in the next men's meeting. Um, uh, uh, men's breakfast. By the way, the men's ministry is Tuesday night. We're doing starting the men's study on Tuesday night. Quick plug for that. But here's the point. Whenever you read Jesus making a statement, you always have to ask yourself, why? Why did he say that at that moment, at that time? What's the context? Well, what is it that provoked Jesus to say, I'm the light of the world? He that follows me, uh, where do I have it? Yeah. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I'm the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the what? The light of what? Life. I'm the light of the world. You follow me, you're no longer walking in darkness. You have the light of life. Why did he say that? Because of the woman caught in adultery and what everybody just witnessed. People in the dark. He's preaching to the crowd. A, 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 an interruption happens. This woman, she's got to be crying, is taken by the religious leaders, thrown in front of his feet, in front of all those people. And he, he's, he, they say to him, hey, this woman is caught in adultery in the very act. The law says she should be put to death. Well, what do you say? trying to pit him against the law, trying to defame him. And you know the story. He exposes them. He, he ignores them first, gets down, kneels down. All kinds of interesting dynamics going on there. I don't have time to get sidetracked. But the point of it is they file out one by one from the oldest to the youngest, honor, shame, culture. Those that had the most to lose, the most honor, the most status were the older ones and Jesus is exposed. He's been light. He's exposed. They don't care about the law. If they cared about the law, where's the dude? You said you caught her in the very act. Where's the dude? There is no dude. Because they don't care about the law. This has nothing to do with them and the law. It has everything to do with them defaming Jesus. And trying to get the spotlight off of him. So he exposes them. He illuminates them for the sham that they were. And then he tells her as she gets up, woman, is there no accusers here? No, Lord. He said, well, I don't accuse you either. Now go. But then what does he say? Sin no more. So if she really was caught in the act of adultery, that is interfacing, interacting with another person the wrong way. That's been exposed too. So Jesus just illuminated what was happening, made it visible. And what was made visible is the religious leaders and the woman were not interacting with stuff, things, including people, the way God designed. That's been illuminated now. And because of that, the woman can go and have proper interaction. Now, did somebody die for the woman's sin, which the Old Testament said, the punishment is death. Yes. Her adultery was paid for with the death. Bingo. Now they don't know that in the moment, but he knows her adultery is going to be punished. There is going to somebody die because of her adultery, but it's not going to be her. It's going to be him. That's the gospel. Right? So, it changes the way when we become a child of God and we now are in the light, we interact with things differently. Okay? So Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee little man was he. <laughs> he climbed up in the sycamore tree to see what he could see, right? Luke 19.8. Tax collector, super wealthy guy. Jesus comes to his house. What does Zacchaeus do? He, sell, he says, Lord, I'm going to sell... What I have, I'm going to give back all the people that I ripped off. And he immediately repents. He starts interacting with stuff and his job as a tax collector the right way. Okay? The members of the first church in Antioch, 
I mean, the first church in Jerusalem, Acts 2, verses 44 and 45, you can write that down, and then Acts 4, 31 and 32. On the day of Pentecost, when the church was birthed, the first thing that happened was, it says, numbers of people sold everything they had. <coughs> they sold their possessions. And they laid it at the feet of the apostles. And then that was dispersed to everyone as anyone had need. They were immediately changed in the way they viewed what they owned. What they had control over. And so nobody forced them. It wasn't a rule. It wasn't a law. They were so radically changed that they said, I want to take what he's given me control over and sell it and use it. For other people. Now it's, it's made clear in Acts 4. After Peter and John get out of jail. And they go back. And they're praying with the believers in Acts chapter 4. And then another group of people get saved. And it says. In that text. It says. No one, they, they began to sell their possessions. And, it, and the mindset was. No one considered. This is the key. No one considered anything they had as their own. That's the biblical mindset. That's the child of God mindset. Nothing you own is yours. It's on loan to you from God. You are a steward of your gifts, your talents, your job, your money, your time. Amen. You don't own it. You're given it to manage and you're going to be held responsible for how you manage it. What you do with it. He's paying attention. Okay? So, all through the New Testament, you see this time and time again. Now, a quick side note. God is not anti-rich. You will never find anything in the scripture that God hates rich people. But riches bring unique challenges. And richness is a totally subjective definition. A few years ago, we had people protesting in our country about, right, the one percenters. Well, guess what? If you live in America, you're a one percenter. It just depends on where you were born and where you grew up. Right? There's people waiting in line, not even waiting to get into this country. To be part of the one percent of the rest of the world. You see, our reference point is so skewed in so many ways. The key thing, though, is... And I'll start to stitch this together. The key thing is the concept of contentment. Okay? Contentment. And contentment, the basic concept, the definition of contentment is, is basically the ability to not let your situation or your circumstances determine your mood. Contentment is the capacity to not let your situation or your circumstances define your mood or the way you interact with them or the way you view them. Now, I get really bugged when I see people use scripture in crazy, goofy ways. One of the things that bugs me is that whole Philippians 4.13 that people put on, football players put on their thing and boxers put on their socks. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That so annoys me. Because it's completely out of context. Right? That verse and that truth, <laughs> I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What is the context? Paul is in prison. He may have his head cut off. He hasn't eaten well in weeks. And he's describing his situation and he says in Philippians 4.11, two verses before verse 13, not that I am speaking of being in need, I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and facing hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The point of I can do all things is 
I can respond rightly to whatever's happening. If I have or I have not, if I'm sick or I'm not sick, my contentment is not dependent on the externals of my life. Contentment is absolutely crucial for the Christian walk. So remember to the soldiers, be content with your wages. Everything in our culture says be discontent with every part of your life. (laughs) Never be content with anything. That's what God wants. No. Contentment is absolutely crucial. Hebrews 13, and this is why we as God's people need to be content. And because when we understand contentment, we're now going to use our stuff that we have control over the right way. Because we know our needs are met and we can get rid of the stuff that we used to think were needs, but now we know they're wants. So, in any and every circumstance, he says, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger. I can do all things through Christ. Now listen to Hebrews 13. This is, this is the crescendo of how to relate to stuff and the consequence of not viewing it the way God designed it to be viewed and interacted with. Let your conduct be without what? Covetousness. Your conduct, believer, should be without covetousness. What is covetousness? It's that lust in your heart to have that which you don't have control of right now. When you covet, you think about it all the time. You think it's going to meet a need. You think it's going to scratch the itch that you have in you. You're looking for meaning and purpose. And you think having that is going to give you that meaning and purpose. You're coveting it. You're putting on it a role God didn't design it to have. And even if you got it, it wouldn't satisfy you. Look at people with money. Right? Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. Jesus, remember, said, your father's not going to leave you nor forsake you. And that's, I'll hit to that in a minute. But the idea being, look, God provides for the birds of the air. If you have food and clothing... You have what you need to live. Everything else is a perk. It's not essential. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. And this is like the the dagger in the heart. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So if you are discontent, if you are coveting things, you are declaring Jesus is a liar. You are communicating to other people that Jesus has left you and forsaken you. Right? Jesus has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So if you are coveting and you're demonstrating in your life and it's visible to other people that you can't find happiness without more and more money, more and more stuff. You're basically saying Jesus is a liar because Jesus said, I'm going to meet your needs. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And you're acting as if I've left you and forsaken you. So you're defaming me. 1 Timothy 6.6. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into this world. And there hasn't, I haven't seen a funeral procession yet, right? With a U-Haul behind the, I mean... You'll see some cemeteries that have that kind of stuff, but we brought nothing into this world. It's certain we can carry nothing out and having food and and clothing with these, we will be content. And the Lord's prayer, give us this day our daily bread. That means nothing to us in this country. Our prayer is give us this week our weekly bread. Give us this month our monthly bread. The people that were part of our church in Cebu, they literally played that, prayed that. Because the kid's in the hospital. He needs medicine. If I buy the medicine for him, I can't feed my other three kids dinner. Give us this day our daily bread. We're so privileged. But Jesus put it into that level. And so all of this to say we are 
changed. God has called us to relate to things now uh, in, in a new way. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to say something here. I want to use an analogy. You guys have ever heard of Pavlov's dogs? Do you know what that's all about? What well, the point of Pavlov's dogs is, right? The point of Pavlov's dogs is, is to demonstrate that you can associate things that should not be associated by repetition. So when a dog sees you holding a piece of meat, raw meat, and it gets a whiff of that, it begins to salivate. It sees a meal. That's God's design. A dog eats meat. Dog sees meat. Dog smells meat. Dog salivates. Dog wants to eat. Pavlov wondered, hmm, I wonder if I can duplicate that same effort by associating something that's not associated at all for a dog, a bell. So he started every time he fed the dog. He held the dog with the meat there. The dog starts, oh, he rang a bell. He rang a bell. So now he associated the bell ringing. Now, does a dog relate to a bell? No. God's design was not for dogs to interact with bells. But he said, I wonder if we can make this happen. So he started ringing a bell. And then eventually, after enough repetition, motor neurons, neuroplasticity, for those of you that study this stuff, the brain wiring changes. And now he just rings a bell and the dog starts salivating. There's no meat. There's nothing to cause it. It's just been produced by repetition. Pavlov's dogs. That's what the enemy does. The point of Pavlov's dogs is you take two things that should not be related and associated with one another and you associate them together. And this is what happens at the fall because of our sin and the enemy. We think stuff and God's designed us to have stuff, but the stuff is to be used as a means to an end to deepen our relationship with God and bless other people. But because of the fall and our own sin and our selfishness, we think stuff is associated with joy and satisfaction and fulfillment. That if you relate to stuff and you use it, you're going to find happiness and peace and fulfillment by having enough and always wanting more. So the enemy has associated things that God's design was not. Our stuff was not designed by God to bring us satisfaction or joy or fulfillment. He was given, it was given to us to use, to manage for his glory and the good of others. And, it, and then joy and satisfaction are the byproduct, the fruit of using what he's designed, what he's put in our hands to manage. And if we manage it for his glory and the good of others, we'll find the joy. But if we look for joy... In the stuff, we're Pavlov's dogs. And that's the process that happens to us as we become the children of the Lord that we already are. He teaches us how to associate things rightly. And now we are in the process of relating to stuff the way he designed us to. There used to be a song in the early 80s by a guy named B.J. Thomas. And the song was... Loving things and using people. Loving things and using people rather than loving people and using things. We use things to love people. That's God's design. But our sin has twisted it where we love things and we use people to obtain more things. And so let me sort of summarize the whole four classes with a movie. Are you ready for that? I got five minutes. Groundhog Day. All right. How many of you have seen Groundhog Day? It is one of the most theologically deep, (laughs) profound movies ever made. I say that with all sincerity. And it's stinking funny. Right? Groundhog Day is the four weeks that I've just taught you. Because what I want you to see, right? You guys know the story? So that first day when he wakes up and it's the same day and everything's unfolding the same day, he's the only one that knows he's he's already lived that day. He knows that. Nobody else does. He's got control. He's got power. He's got knowledge and information that nobody else has. 
He knows what they're going to say before they say it. What they're going to do before they do it. He knows the consequences of their decisions before they make them. He's got power and authority. And the beginning of the movie, once he gets that power, this is pre-born again. <laughs> he uses his power for what purpose? His own ends. So he starts putting the move on the girl. Because he's got the knowledge ahead of time what's going to happen. He starts maneuvering to get that girl into bed. So he uses what he has control and power over for what purpose? Self, self-love, self-fulfillment. Using people to satisfy himself. And then he goes through a process where he can't, he can't do it, right? She's not buckling. She's not, she's not buying it. At some point in his trials, she, she realizes this guy's a dirtbag. And then he gets, he changes, right? And now he gets mad. And he's angry. And he doesn't want to live any longer. So he tries to kill himself every day. But he keeps waking up. So he's not relating to people the right way. Now he can't get what he wants, so he's not relating to himself the right way. He tries to take his own life. And after a few days of that, something happens in him. And then he, try, he be, tries to be a little more methodical about it. But you know the story, right? So eventually what happens? What's the turning point in the movie? He gets born again. He realizes, I've got knowledge and I've got power. And everything that I've been using with my knowledge before is, is, is self-absorbed. I've been using what is a resource in my hands for my own selfish gain, and it's made me miserable. And so he has an aha moment, and the next day he gets up and he starts to view his knowledge and his power in a new way. What if I used my knowledge and power, the resources I have control over, for goodness, for the good of other people? So... What if when Ned, hey, Ned Ryerson, and he steps in the puddle, right? You guys remember that? That part of the movie? The same guy every day? Hey, it's Ned, Ned Ryerson, the goofy looking guy, and then he always steps off the curb into the big puddle, pothole. Life insurance. That's right. What if he used his knowledge and power that Ned's going to step in the puddle to say, Ned, come on over here and show some interest in Ned now? And what if the people in the diner, he starts saying, hey, buddy, it's okay to ask her to marry you. So now he's, he's changed in the way he relates to himself, to other people, and right to ultimately the girl and, and stuff. And so what ends up happening is, right, he, gets, he breaks the cycle. He's born again. He starts a new life that one day he wakes up and... It's actually the next day. It's, there's a lot of biblical themes in a lot of movies. They're there. You just got to see them. Right? And, and that's, so that movie is an example of everything that I've tried to collapse into these four weeks. So the bottom line is, like, we're new creations in Christ. Everything has changed. The way we relate to God, the way we relate to ourselves, the way we relate to other people. And if it doesn't change the way that we relate to our stuff, then we have to question whether we've actually surrendered to the king and become his child. And there's a joke among pastors, you know, the last thing to get saved is somebody's wallet. <laughs> so pastors pray for lean forward offerings, so they go for the wallet instead of lean back offerings where they go for the change. Right? Right? And when you meet people who interact with their stuff, it's like, this is mine. This is not mine, it's God's. As a missionary, I needed people. We came back on Pharrell to say, hey, it's my car, but it's the Lord that gave me the car. You can use my car to go on Pharrell. Yeah, you can put thousands of miles on it. You can use my car to go do this ministry in Mexico, even though you're going to break the windshield on it. Not intentionally, but the windshield will be broken. Hey, it's not my car. It's the Lord's car. What if we really did view our stuff that way and said, what have you blessed me with that I can use to bless other people with? I don't know. So let's, let's close. Let me close with that. Um, and then I do want to break up one more time. This is the last one with me leading this. I want to break up into groups. And what I'd like you to do is, 
is in your little group, just share, if you're willing to, share with the group, like what is the major, what is the most significant crisis event that you've experienced in your life? Because again, what, part of what we're trying to do is get to know one another. And the way we get to know one another is kind of sharing parts of our story. And when we share our, who we are, parts of our story, it's an on-ramp. It's a tether of connection with other people. So as you guys break up, just kind of think about like what, what has been one of the major or maybe one or two traumatic moments in your life that you've experienced that you know, God has brought you through. And whether you've changed your perspective on it or whether you are still wrestling with it, just kind of share. This is, this is one of the major things that I've experienced in my life. All right, so let's do that. Let's break up and do that. And then I'll call you order in 10 minutes. 13 minutes, you have 13 minutes. God bless you.